World War II aircraft are generally known for being prop planes, but jets, modern jets, got their start during that time. Multiple nations experimented with the technology, and a handful of designs did become operational, such as the Gloucester Meteor or the ME-262. But there are plenty of other experimental jets thrown out there that are a bit more obscure. So instead of focusing on the ones that pretty much everybody already heard about, I decided I wanted to make a list this week talking about the more obscure jet designs from the war. There are quite a few, so I could actually make a sequel if this list does well, but for now, let's talk about five rather obscure jets from World War II. The Arado AR-234 Blitz. I put this one lower on the list because this one actually entered service and it's not as obscure as the others, but it is still a bit lesser known. This was supposed to be a jet-powered bomber and was actually the world's first operational turbojet-powered bomber. It first flew on June 15, 1943 and was introduced in September of 1944. But if you're familiar with dates involving World War II, you know this thing showed up incredibly late to the party, particularly for the German side. There really wasn't anything they could throw out there at that point that would have changed their fortunes. But the background here is that during the closing months of 1940, the German Ministry of Aviation offered a tender for a jet-powered high-speed reconnaissance aircraft with a range of 2,156 kilometers. Arado was the only company to actually respond to that, though, and the design they proposed was fairly conventional, except it was driven by turbojets. Now, there were a whole bunch of different variants of the Blitz, but by the time they were ready to roll, the bombing capability of the Luftwaffe had been reduced and there weren't that many experienced pilots left. Plus, building them was a pain. Experienced workers were harder to find, as were facilities due to being bombed uh, a lot. The engines they were using also were never that reliable and they would get worse, which was attributed to the poor quality of the fuel they had. It got so bad that they would actually have to be overhauled or replaced entirely after just 10 hours of operation, which is disgusting frankly, but that wasn't really the plane's fault. In terms of the actual aircraft's performance, they were fine. Not necessarily amazing, but totally fine. There was nothing really wrong with them. They were just thrown into a situation they had just no real way of functioning well in, which any aircraft would have struggled with. And by the end of the war, most of these planes were actually sitting, waiting for fuel or qualified personnel to utilize them. The few that could fly actually still continued combat operations until Germany surrendered, and they were captured by the Allies and then examined. One of these aircraft did actually survive. It was one of the Vommer variants, with the manufacturer's serial number of 140312. And today she sits on display in the Stephen F. Udzar Hazy Center near Dulles International Airport in Fairfax County, Virginia. So, you can still see this interesting aircraft if you want. The Bell P-59 Era Comet. This was a single-seat, twin-jet fighter aircraft that was designed by Bell Aircraft during World War II, first flying on October 1st, 1942. It was also the first jet ever produced in the United States, and since the British were actually further along when it came to jet development at the time, they wound up giving us one of their engines to copy. And that became the basis for the General Electric J-31 jet engine that was used by this aircraft. But jets were still in their infancy. And this particular plane, well, <clears throat> it entered service just not in combat. Tests with them showed poor engine response and reliability, which was actually pretty normal for early turbojets, frankly. The planes also had poor lateral and directional stability at speeds over 290 miles per hour, which is a problem because going fast was kind of the point of the jets. They couldn't do that. And even when they were pushed over that threshold, they really couldn't go very fast. There was insufficient thrust. It was far below expectations, so they were always underpowered. These things were outperformed by both the P-47 Thunderbolt and the P-38J Lightning. 
but it was decided to still use them, just not for combat purposes. They were used as training aircraft to familiarize pilots with the operations of jet aircraft. Those pilots would go on to fly newer jets that actually worked better, such as the Lockheed P-80 shooting stars. So while they were certainly flawed, they were a learning experience for the United States. The Gloucester E-28-39 Sometimes called the Gloucester Whittle, the Gloucester Pioneer, or the Gloucester G-40. So that's a lot of different names for this one plane. But okay, this is the product of a specification that was issued by the Air Ministry for a suitable aircraft to test, just test, the jet propulsion designs that Frank Whittle had been developing during the 1930s. This plane was effectively a platform just to see how jets worked and how they could be utilized in a proper fighter aircraft. They were relatively small, with only a length of 25 feet 3 and 3 quarter inches, a wingspan of 29 feet 0 inches, and a height of 9 feet 3 inches. And they were fairly fast, but not blindingly so, with a maximum speed of 466 miles per hour at 10,000 feet. Two different prototypes were produced, though one was actually destroyed due to improper maintenance that caused a critical aileron failure. But that really wasn't the design's fault, and much data was gathered regarding the use of jets, which would lead to the development of the Gloucester Meteor. So this little baby test aircraft definitely pulled their weight in terms of really showing what jets could do. The surviving prototype was actually held for preservation in the Science Museum in central London. She's been there since 1946, and there are several full-size models of the plane in various other locations in the UK. So all in all, a good showing for what is just a testing platform. The Caproni Campini N1. Okay, so I want to preface this with the fact that this is a weird, weird plane. It doesn't look that weird. It looks like an early jet. And it is, but it's not a normal jet. This aircraft was constructed in the 1930s by Italian aircraft manufacturer Caproni. When it first flew in 1940, it was actually briefly regarded as the first successful jet-powered aircraft in history, but that was before the Italians found out about the Heinkel HE-178. More on that uh, later in the video. See, this aircraft did not work like pretty much any kind of jet that you're probably familiar with. The engine is not a normal jet. It's known, generally, as a motor jet, not a turbo jet, or a turbo fan for that matter. The actual design is fairly conventional, just a monoplane built entirely out of duralumin with an elliptical wing. The initial prototype did lack elements like a pressurized cabin, but those improvements were featured on the second prototype. But due to excessive heat output from the propulsion system, the canopy actually had to be left permanently open. So, um, yeah, the uh, pressurized cabin was never really relevant. But where the plane gets weird as heck is the engine, like I said. The compressor in this thing, which is a three-stage variable incendence one, was driven by a conventional piston engine, a 900-horsepower liquid-cooled Isata Frascini unit. The airflow that was provided by that compressor was used to cool the engine before being mixed with the engine's exhaust gases which would recover most of the heat energy that'd be wasted on a traditional piston-powered propeller plane. So that part was good. And a ring-shaped burner then injected fuel into the gas flow and ignited it immediately before the exhaust nozzle, which would further increase thrust. And in practice, this particular design provided enough thrust for flight without activating the rear burner which makes it a little bit similar to a ducted fan coupled with an afterburner, but not quite. The actual designer, Secondo Campini, referred to this as a thermojet, but it's commonly referred to as a motor jet. It was weird, but it did technically work. But the relatively small size of the duct limited the mass flow, and as a result, the propulsive efficiency of the engine. In more modern designs, this would be offset through high overall pressure ratios, but that couldn't be achieved on the N1. So these planes were pretty underpowered, actually. Low thrust and bad fuel efficiency. When it flew, it was actually slower than a lot of existing conventional aircraft of the era. So the prototypes never led to any operational units. 
and the motor jet design was superseded by the more powerful turbo jets the Germans were fiddling around with. But the N1 was still considered an interesting experiment, and worthy of praise for the effort, regardless of how it turned out. One of the examples actually has survived, and is on display at the Italian Air Force Museum near Rome. The Heinkel HE-178. Yeah, see, I told you we were going to talk about this. Well, most people talk about the ME-262 when it comes to the first operational jet fighter, it was not the first jet in general, not the first one to fly. The 178 was an experimental aircraft designed by Heinkel and was the world's first aircraft to fly using the thrust from a turbojet engine. But we are once again talking about what was effectively a test bed. The 178 was developed just to test the jet propulsion concept that was designed by the German engineer Hans von Ohain during the mid-1930s. Von Ohain had gotten industrial support from Ernst Heinkel so he could demonstrate a working turbojet engine. Heinkel was interested enough to pursue development of the 178 as a private venture, independent of both the German authorities and the Luftwaffe, and he was able to keep the aircraft a secret for much of its development. Heinkel really wanted to demonstrate the capabilities of gas turbines in aviation, but also he really wanted to push for high-speed flight technologies. The first prototype flew on August 27th, 1939. The flight only lasted for six minutes, and had actually been preceded by a short hop by the prototype just three days before. Officials of the Nazi party actually attended the event, such as Ernst Udet and Erhard Milch, but they weren't very impressed by this particular aircraft. There were limitations to what it could do, with a maximum speed of 372 miles per hour, which was decent on its own and really poor endurance. The 178 couldn't fly for very long, only about 10 minutes, which was gross, frankly. So production models were never put into place. However, the plane was successful in a technical sense. It proved that the turbojet could make an aircraft fly and fly pretty well. Michael was very disappointed by the lack of official interest in his private venture jet. The relevant data was gathered from the 178, and he would again embark on development of a twin-engine jet fighter as another private venture, which would result in the HE-280, which was the first prototype jet-powered fighter aircraft. The original prototype's airframe was actually placed on display in Berlin, but did not survive very long. She was destroyed in an air raid in 1943, so unfortunately she's long gone. But there is a replica at the Rostock airport in, well, Rostock in Germany. So that's something, I suppose. And with that, a special thank you so to all my underwater train finders, some dude 267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitson 131-232, and Zach A1, Arthur Roy, Tommy Rossini, Brian, Jack Carson's Row of Videos, Lord Off444, Mark Holding, Murder Drone Stall, A Person 723, Row Hudson 2860, Icefer 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Matt Weaver, Tom Red Lion, and his Productions 8104, Hendrick Motorsports Fan 5, Wheeljack 8401, Rescues, Greyhounds, The Baxter, Caleb Crosswhite, Ohio Trucker 1, Andrew Bowen, Josh Johnson, Hayden DeGro, Caleb Brainwaters, Prez Drenton, Master of None, Arizona Hot Rail, Liam Wright, Mr. Sleepy, Travis Talinsky, Jared Brussel, Dr. Razor 78, Joshua Long, Hannah Bird, and Amdrak 2024 Productions. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fun farewell.